parents for a while. And that is where Lucas met Becky Powell, who was Otis's niece. She was starved for attention. Becky was retarded. Her upbringing wasn't much better than Henry's. She was raised uh, by grandma. Her mama was crazy. If the two made for a bizarre looking couple, Henry didn't seem to mind. I think she actually looked up to Henry almost maybe as a father-like figure to some extent. I would guess it'd come as close to being the love of his life as Henry could get. And for the first time since his release from prison, Henry got steady work. He took a job with Otis at a roofing company, fixed cars for people in the neighborhood, and sold scrap metal, all to help keep Becky happy. But Henry would also jealously guard his young lover's time. He kept Becky away from school, the one place where she tried to fit in. I read some of her school books that she had accumulated somehow, and, and she'd study, and then she'd give herself a test at the end, and then she'd write her own praises. Very good, very excellent, you know, and that kind of stuff. And it sort of made you sad for her, because she was studying the book herself, taking her test, and then grading it herself, and telling herself how good she was. By January 1982, Becky's already meager family life began to fall apart. Her mother had died of a drug overdose. A few months earlier, her caretaker grandmother passed away. Becky was suddenly in the care of two ex-cons, her uncle Otis and his buddy, Henry Lee Lucas. The state of Florida intervened and took Becky to an emergency shelter. Henry was furious. He got word to Becky and convinced her to run away with him. And they just hit the road and started started uh, traveling. They, Lucas favored the interstate highway system, and they would uh, just drive from place to place. They would sleep in the car. They would camp out. They drove junkers that other people had abandoned that, that Henry could fix up and, and keep going. They came through Houston on I-10 and out towards California, and that's where they met up with Jack Smart. Jack Smart owned an antique shop. He and his wife, Obera, took pity on the young couple and offered Henry a job. In May, Obera Smart asked Henry if he would be willing to work for her aging mother, Kate Rich, in North Texas. For Henry and Becky, the plan was a lifesaver. For Kate Rich, it was a fatal mistake. He pointed to the ground and he said, if you dig right there, you'll find part of her. Henry Lee Lucas and his 15-year-old girlfriend, Becky Powell, were tired and hungry when they arrived in tiny Ringgold, Texas in 1982. They were met with a curious but trusting eye by their new employer, 82-year-old Kate Rich. She had recently broken her hip and was struggling to get through her days. I think she was lonely to a certain extent and welcomed them being there. She'd been through this world and, and all of its knocks and come out of it. Henry knew Kate lived on Social Security. Within days, he convinced her to let him take over her accounts in the local stores. It was a big mistake. They were uh, taking advantage of her, charging at the store, not doing the work that they were supposed to do to fix the place up, things like that. Kate began to mistrust Henry, but she took a grandmotherly interest in Becky. She noticed Becky was fighting with Henry, begging him to go back to Florida. Becky just got enough, finally, of the life on the road. I don't know if it was a process of maturation or just simply being homesick to being back in Florida. Henry made it clear he intended to stay in Texas, despite the problems he was having with Kate Rich's family. Uh, Mrs. Rich's family became concerned about Lucas uh, and thought he wasn't the kind of person ought to be around her, and they eventually ran him off. Henry and Becky were back on the highway. Out of the blue, Reverend Reuben Moore of the House of Prayer spotted them in his truck. He brought them home to his religious commune, located on this old chicken ranch. Henry lived right here, this little section here. Henry and Becky moved into this chicken coop. It was hot and dirty, but Henry didn't seem to mind. As for Becky, she was starting to unravel. She scribbled a note in her math book. Dear God, please help me. I am a runaway. She asked forgiveness and added, don't let men get used to me or attach. Becky even got in touch with Kate Rich, 
who encouraged the girl to confront Henry. She told Henry, okay, I'm going back to Florida. And uh, he made a big show of uh, leaving the house of prayer and saying that he was gonna take Becky back to Florida. Without a plug nickel between them, they started to hitchhike. They made it as far as Denton and turned into this old hobo camp by the side of the road. Henry was drinking. It's real hot. I sat out there and continued arguing. We kept arguing and cussing each other. And finally, I just uh, told her what we were going back the next morning. And uh, Becky slapped him. And he just grabbed the knife up and stabbed her. I just picked it up off the blanket, brought it around, hit her right in the chest with it. She groaned a little bit, tried to say something, maybe stabbed her again, I forget what. Uh, but he said, it was just reflex. Henry murdered Becky in much the same way he killed his mother. He was drunk, they were fighting, he reached for a knife and lunged. And then he said he had sex with Becky after she died. I guess it got to be a part of my life. Had sexual intercourse with his head. And then he said he cut her into uh, uh, small pieces, as he put it, uh, and then uh, then left and went back to the house of prayer. He was gone about 24 hours and came back and told them that Becky ran off and left him. And he didn't know what to do. He was crying and telling them what happened, and they felt sorry for him. But one person saw through the lie, Kate Rich. When people at the church told her Becky was missing, she wanted to know what happened. She was asking questions. Henry made a cold-blooded plan to shut her up. He took her out ostensibly for a ride and ended up stabbing her and then uh, having sex with her body. Pulled her out the right side, down the embankment, had sex with her. In the road is where we found her glasses. And washed out the other end is where we found the uh, part of her clothing. Uh, he left the body out for a while and then thought better of that and retrieved the body and took it back to his uh, quarters in the chicken coop and cut it up and then burned it in a, uh, a stove. Within days of Kate Rich's disappearance, her children filed a missing persons report. When the local sheriff, Hound Dog Conway, heard about Henry Lee Lucas and his long prison record, he knew the little drifter was good for the murder. With Ranger Ryan's help, he brought Henry in on a gun possession charge. We took him, put him in jail, made a pact not to even talk to him. Uh, that was Saturday night, and Wednesday night I get a call that uh, Henry wants to talk. He's passed a note out of the jail. I killed Kate Rich, Henry wrote, and Becky as well, even though he said she was the only girl he ever loved. These first confessions Henry made were credible. Next came a flurry of evil admissions that, as Henry told it, made him America's most notorious serial killer. What's the youngest one? Uh, about a month old. About a month old. Uh, Henry was accidental. This was a typical Henry Lee Lucas confession. An accident? I didn't see the baby until it was too late. She had the baby in her arms when I shot her. It's one of hundreds Lucas gave in the winter of 1983. His stories oftentimes captivated the most hard-boiled police officer. Out of curiosity, Henry, who do you think you killed? Hard to believe, but 350. And Henry seemed as if he was on a mission to fill in the blanks on every last one of them. Lucas had confessed earlier that year to killing his girlfriend, Becky Powell, and 82-year-old Kate Rich. He was convicted for both murders and knew he would spend the rest of his life behind bars. He seemed to be free of any burdens and spent the days producing details of other crimes to share with anxiously waiting detectives. Everyone that showed up, you know, would say, be careful with him. He'll lie to you more times than he'll tell you the truth. I showed you. Sheriff Jim Boutwell of Williamson County, Texas, was one of the first police officers to seek a confession from Henry. Jim Boutwell had an unsolved homicide that dated back to Halloween of 1979 when a woman was found dead and nude under a culvert on Interstate 35. Uh, the only thing she had on was a pair of orange socks, and they never did identify the body, and so uh, she suddenly became known not as Jane Doe, but as orange socks. 
We filed a case against Lucas for murder, and uh, at that point in time, Lucas went into more details about the killing. I drove her like this over here. Boutwell desperately needed those details to get a conviction. The second time you had sex with her, she didn't want to. We alleged there was a murder in connection with a sexual assault. Although he was twice convicted for murder, this case added the charge of sexual assault, which meant the death penalty. But Henry's attorney, Parker McCullough, had serious doubts about the state's case. The prosecution's theory was that he picked up this woman in Oklahoma, killed her in Texas, threw her body out north of Georgetown, and then drove like crazy over to Jacksonville, Florida. When news reporter Hugh Ainsworth heard this, he started digging. He found out that work records placed Lucas in Florida the day after the killing. How much sense does it make to you to drive 11, 1,200 miles, going about an average of 70 miles an hour to kill someone you didn't even know or didn't know was going to be there? I mean, give me a break. <laughs> Ainsworth took a close look at all of Henry's confessions. Meanwhile, as the state prepared its case, Sheriff Boutwell installed Henry in his tiny jail in Georgetown. This was Henry's cell. What was it like? What, how'd they treat you? Better than any king had ever been treated. Like how? Uh, I had anything I wanted. I had colored TV. I had cases of cigarettes. Not just cartons, but I'm talking about cases of cigarettes. He had a good thing going at the jail. If he wanted more cigarettes, all he had to do was ask for cigarettes. If he wanted more coffee, all he had to do was ask for more coffee. If he wanted another milkshake, all he had to do was ask for another milkshake. The little drifter had become a star from coast to coast, a human confession machine. Calls poured into Sheriff Boutwell's office from other jurisdictions. To cope with the burden, he turned to the Texas Rangers for help. They created a special Henry Lee Lucas task force. Ranger Sergeant Bob Prince helped coordinate the visiting cops. We had somewhere around 1,000 officers that were actually there representing a little over 500 agencies. We got all, all levels. We had to come in and build overalls to uh, T-shirts to, you know, uh, dress very professionally. The task force asked all incoming detectives to provide them with case files in advance of their interviews with Henry. That was not unusual. What was unusual, according to Hugh Ainsworth, was that Henry was allowed to read over the case files and study crime scene photographs before his interrogation. And I was even in the office when I saw case files. He'd be sitting at a desk. There'd be six, eight, maybe only four or five, depending on the day, case files. Ainsworth wondered if sloppy police work on the part of the Texas Rangers created conditions for investigators like Sheriff Boutwell to obtain valuable confessions from Henry. He could tell if there's a water tower nearby. He could tell if there was a, a bridge there. He could tell how the body was placed, you know. And so he convinced a lot of cops around the country that he really did it. Bob Prince denies any wrongdoing, and there was no evidence the Rangers intentionally compromised Henry's confessions. We would talk to him about how to handle the interview, uh, what to do, what not to do, uh, mainly what not to do. Don't feed him information. Don't show him photographs. I don't know of anything more that we could have done to ensure the credibility. Investigators in California pressed ahead anyway. They arranged for a private jet to pick Henry up and fly him to various murder sites around the state. Henry rewarded them with the kind of confessions they could use to sew up their cases. It must have been incredible to Lucas. After all these years of being a loser, suddenly, you know, he was important. He was being treated very well. They wanted to keep him happy and keep him talking. Henry talked so much that as the Orange Sox case came to trial, he had been convicted of, or pled guilty to, seven murders, all in Texas. Investigators from around the country connected Lucas to at least 175 murders. 
They believed that Henry Lee committed those crimes.